Bible tonight. Turn to the book of Luke, please. Book of Luke. Chapter number 18. Verse number 11. I'll read you a few verses and then we'll pray, all right? Brother Smith, it's good to see you there tonight. I've got three of them sitting there in a row, I think, but uh, I'm looking at the one in the middle there, the man in the middle. Uh, it's good to see you here. Let's see here, verse number 11. Oh, let me back up a couple verses, give us a little runway. Let's go back to verse 6. And the Lord said... Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, through, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, he shall, as shall he find faith on the earth. And he spake this parable unto the, uh, the certain which trusted in themselves. Interesting statement there, huh? And he spake this parable unto the certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised other. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as this other man, uh, men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers or even this publican I fast twice in the week I give tithes of all that I possess and the publicans standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven but smote his breast saying God be merciful to me a sinner verse 14 I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted heavenly father we see this passage and it grates on all of us that such a thing could happen in the pompous attitude of the religious uh, in the room as we see this publican beating his chest and crying out to God and the critical nature that that he had towards him so grateful that he wasn't as such a person as this one father please as we uh, briefly tonight look at this passage of scripture and have some thoughts regarding uh, how our Lord looks at things blessed now to thy honor and glory in Jesus name I ask it amen Judgment seat of Christ. Christians learn and they will find out where we really were. Amen? We get to the judgment seat of Christ. We see this Pharisee as he had already decided how wonderful he was and how superior he was to this poor wretched man next to him, the publican, who is beating his chest and ask, asking for God for, to for, forgive him. And it's a... Um, it's an amazing thing. We all, not all of us, but a portion of us tonight grew up in Christian homes. And there was, we didn't realize it so much then. But as we've gotten older, we've realized that that was a great asset and a great benefit to us to have such an opportunity to grow up in a Christian home where our parents took us to church every Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, fill in the blank, Youth conferences, camp, on and on it goes, truly, right? Warriors, um, Sunday school classes with all kinds of assets to, to help young, young people understand. And then we get to the youth conferences and then Bible colleges and all these things that, that came as possibilities to many Christians in their life as a result of perhaps their parents who came to Christ. Uh, Brother Don came to Christ. How old were you, Don? about 20 years old and um, 
and Tracy more like 40. It took her a little while. I'm joking. <laughs> I'll pay for that later, right? <laughs> a week later? That's, that was about my mom and dad as well. About a week later, my mother got saved. And, um, and then what was, what was the outpouring of that? Now we have Pastor Nelson and Corey and the rest of the family, um, uh, uh, Rachel, and do you have, did I miss somebody? Your great granddaughter, okay, I, was, I, I, I did pretty good, I got the kids. But you know, as a result of that though, what, all those, they, they were raised up in church. And that's why there's such a dynamic difference between you know Don and his sons. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and what a what a delightful man he is. But I would I would tell you there's sometimes we we forget our heritage, and we forget, or we we don't really address or really think about too often what a great asset that was. Oh, we can look back at our heritage and say, well, you know, this thing happened in Christian school or this thing happened on a youth activity and then you get a fair shake. And we, we can look at all those things and probably find some fault in our history, right? We said Christian worker didn't treat us fairly or fill in the blank. There's, there's all kinds of, in Christian school, there's on, honestly, because you've got more Christian workers involved, there's a little more criticism, uh, you know, in the Christian schools and things of that nature. And isn't it quite amazing, all these assets that came our way as being born into a Christian home, perhaps trusting Christ at age five, age four, age 10, whatever, fill in the blank. But we came to Christ at, at early ages. And we've now been throughout our whole lives, and in my case, just my father was a pastor when I was born, as the, the last uh, distant child. And uh, my sister was 15 years older. So all my siblings were born prior to, to my parents coming to Christ. And I was, I was the only one born afterwards. And um, so anyway, as you understand, um, literally the first Sunday that I was home, I was in church. And my dad pastored most of my grown up years. So you can imagine, I was, I was in everything going on. Junior Jets for Jesus. I won't sing in that song, but I could. And... Um, Okay, I will. No, I'm joking. <laughs> and I could sing the Kobiak, Camp Kobiak song t to you from camp. Do they have a, a camp song at, at uh, the, camp, the camp our kids go to? I've never been there. They switch it every year. Liberals. Uh, <laughs> now, it was a specific song where it had the word Camp Kobiak in it. I should go ahead and sing it, but I'm not going to. But it had the word camp word in it, you know, come believe, accept, Kobiak, you know, and it was... So, I mean, that was a great place for me growing up and decisions I made at Camp Kobiak. And, and then I went my last two, a year and a half of my last years were in, in a Christian school and in high school and Bible college. And so, some, it, somehow, you know, we, all those things, is it fair to say we just kind of took it for granted? You know, it was just kind of the thing. I, I, I don't ever remember in my life not thinking about and just planning. I mean, from a little kid, I just planned I'd go to Bible college. I, I, I guess because my sister did and my brothers did, I just assumed that's what I would do. I would go to Bible college. And that would, how many, how many folks in the room got, got a chance to go to Bible college? See, a fair, fair number, I'm not sure we're half, but we're, we're close to it. Oh, well, maybe, yeah, well, these kids, we're, we're probably at least half of us that got to go to Bible college out of high school and all the benefits of, of going to Bible college and being around more Christian people and more preaching and, and training and all these things were things that we did. And in some sense, that was just our life. You know, I didn't think about it being like anything special. I just thought that was, that was Tyler, that was status quo for me. You get up and go to church every Sunday morning for Sunday school and anything going on, revival meetings, and, you know, revival meetings, sometimes we travel and go to a revival meeting, and um, special guest, occasionally, we we had one, when I was a little boy, Jack the Nimpy came to our church, and we're in Philly in Michigan, there's three people in the town, no, 
actually there's five no, I'm joking. but it's it's really small yes it's, it's it's a yellow light but you don't have to slow down you just you blaze right through it on on m53 and you just keep just keep going fast as you can that's the town it was and so that's I, I, I just remember being there on M53 and one Sunday morning for Sunday school and, and church, uh, Jack Benimpi came in. Now this is when he was young and he came in, sat down. And of course, I, I, we, I didn't know Jack Benimpi, right? But my dad, he was a nervous wreck preaching. You can imagine being the pastor of a little church with, I don't know, 50 people there and Jack Benimpi sitting in the back row, right? And uh, now we were planning on going to the revival and everything because he was going to be in our city, or not much of a city, Bad X, Michigan, was going to be preaching a revival. And as it turned out, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the story. I'm this deep into it. He, um, he always, people would ask him to come. He played the accordion. He called it an accordion because it was, it was a special one. And I mean, the guy could play it like nobody's business. He was just phenomenal, phenomenal on the accordion. He, you know, he sold records and stuff. And his wife, Rex Sala, was a beautiful, beautiful singer. And so they, they had come to, he had, they just come to our church because they were, you know, just to be in church Sunday morning, right? And um, so anyway, Jack met Jack Benimpi when I was a little boy. And then we went to the meetings every night and got to hear Jack Benimpi. As it turned out, he had been invited to this church uh, in Fillion, Michigan, and he thought it was to play for the evangelist and play his accordion for the special music, because that's what he had, to this point in his life, that's what he had done. He'd, he'd go to different evangelistic meetings and provide the special music. And so when he got to Fillion, he got there, and, and the pastor, you know, was talking to him, and he asked the pastor who the evangelist was for the, for the meeting, and he said, well, I, th I thought you preached. He said, oh, no, I just, I, just, I just play. He said, well, I don't have an evangelist coming. Would you mind doing it? So that, that literally was his first, his first revival was in this little podunk church. I was just a little kid, but I just we got to go to his meetings and got to talk to him after he preached. And, and um, I remember people, quite the first night, a lot of people left that meeting. They did not know what they got into with Dr. Jackman Impey back in the day. Well, he was a hard preacher. And he emptied quite a few of them out of there that first night. And, uh, but you get the point. That's my, that's my childhood. Uh, Dr. Jack, ben, Jack ben Hippie. You know he's the walking Bible, right? You ever heard that? The walking Bible? Because he's memorized practically the whole Bible. He's incredible memory. And so he's called the walking Bible. 19 years old, he's preaching at Hiles Anderson at Chapel. And kids were getting their Bibles signed. And I, I just wanted to shake his hand. That's all I wanted to do. I hadn't, hadn't seen him since I was a little kid. And uh, so I just got in line. With, and I was kind of new to the Bible signing thing. And so I just got in line with all the folks. And I, 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 kudos to them for getting their Bible signed. I should have. Uh, but I just walked up and I just shook his hand. I just, I just wanted to, to, to meet you. And um, I just introduced myself to him. I just said, I'm Tim McCurdy. I just wanted to meet you. And uh, as soon as I said that, he said, Philly in Michigan. So he truly has a memory that is quite amazing. I was like, whoa. I wasn't going to say anything about it because it's, it's too distant. You know, I was a little kid. But he got to meet Jack Benimpi when I was a college student and when I was a little boy. Many of you could tell stories like that of people that you met when you were a little kid, an evangelist that came to your church, an evangelist maybe you went to a conference and you got to meet Dr. Rice or Brother Hiles, or you got to meet some of these men, and you thought, wow, this is great. I got to meet these guys that I've heard of, and I've listened to preach. And those, those are childhood experiences you have. Do you realize how amazing that is? It's not just your status quo life. It's, I don't know if it's one in a million people. How many, how many people? 330 million people in, in our country plus you realize being born into a Christian home and have opportunities that we have for our children here and children and young people in your life, the things that you have received. We have this man, the publican, and he's coming to God and he's, he's beating his breast. God, forgive me, a sinner, right? Please forgive me, God. And then we have the publican that's looking down saying, wow, I'm glad I'm not, not, I'm not like that guy. 
I don't think we, I don't think for a moment that we behave that way, but I do want to call our attention to the fact that there's a lot of folks in our church that didn't have those privileges. Amen? They're, they're hearing me talk right now, and they're probably thinking, oh my goodness, would to God I'd had that chance. Would to God I would have had that situation. Would to God I, I could have gone to Christian schools or been in Sunday school when I was a kid. Life, did, life for them didn't go that way, and, and they, they're bringing their children up now in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and bringing their children to Sunday school and giving their children that Christian upbringing that is just going to be invaluable to them as parents, probably more than to us that raised our kids in church. We just did it automatically, right? For them, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a new opportunity that they're taking advantage of to raise their children in church. The nurture and the admonition of, and to go to camp and maybe go to Bible college someday. All those things are new. I will tell you that's an amazing thing to have lived and had the opportunity to be in all those assets in our life. And I just want to call our attention to it. As I looked at this man that had been a, probably an up a muckety muck, you might say, in his church or in his synagogue, and he's an important man, and he's had all these assets of being trained in the Jewish religion and having the, the, the scriptures that they had, uh, the Old Testament, the Torah, and so it, the Torah, and so they, he had all of these things in his life, but when he looked at this man that didn't have those assets, he was very looking down and, of course, greatly displeased the Lord. And the one man that was coming to God in humility was forgiven. And the other man we read about, and we're still reading about this man 2,000 years later, honestly with disdain for that kind of attitude. Amen? Young children, to be sitting in a church tonight and be looking at a future of opportunities, don't dwindle those opportunities away. Young people, take advantage of them. If you can go to camp, go to camp. If you can go, go to Christian activities and the conferences and all these things, go to them. Sometimes it's going to be hard. Some of you kids are on the bus, you need transportation, and, and I know we, we're working very hard to get you here, but those are such great assets in your life to have be building a building block, a foundation in your life that you have a foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ for, for much of your time. Bus workers... And it's an amazing investment to bring these children to church so they, they have an, at least they've been having have been given the opportunity to follow in the way of the Lord. I realize it's a, it's a more difficult path for them to, to, to get in that path of following the Lord. But there's a fair number of kids tonight that are sitting here and praise the Lord that you, you got the opportunity to be in church and, and you're here and you're following the Lord and some in Bible college and, and what a blessing it is some of you are are new believers in the church and 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 you're just um, you're just trying to get the hang of it right it's it's, it's new and, and this is like you don't you don't know all the, the the Christian protocols and all the all the habits and all the things that we just kind of do and we don't even think about it right but you're you're kind of watching like the way things work and and you know where you're supposed to be and when you're supposed to be there and what you know how just you know it's it's all new and don't think for a moment it's the it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a great blessing to all of us, far more than you would understand. We compare it to, and it's it's a fair comparison. But when you have a new child, you bring that new child home. It's just every little thing they do. It doesn't matter how much sense it makes. It's just cool. Like, did you see what this, she just moved? Oh, she just did this. Oh, she did that. Sam doesn't do that anymore. She's just like, are you hungry? Okay, be, don't, you're not hungry. Be quiet. No, I'm joking. <laughs> You do have your hands full of little girl. And, uh, but, but you know what I'm talking about. The first things, those, those things are so important. And, and young Christians of the church, can I tell you, that the, the things that, that you're doing are just such a gigantic blessings to us and such, a, such a, a great new life to the church to see new believers. And don't, don't worry so much about all the protocols. You'll figure them out, right? They're just... We're, we're, we're uh, you know, we just know how things work, so to speak, in the Christian life, and that's new to you. And so, 
Um, don't, don't get yourself all, and, and honestly, you all, you all, the new ones are just fantastic, and you're, you're just grasping onto things so, so quickly, and the discipleship program now, some of the new ones are teaching discipleship to others, and it's just, oh my, can we all just say a big hallelujah right there? Amazing. Praise the Lord for it. See if I can find somewhere in my, where I'm at in my notes right now. It might be hopeless, though. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse number 12. 10, 12 of 1 Corinthians. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. I'm in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. The things that have come your way, and it tells us to what be, take heed for the ones that raised your hands, and we had this tremendous privilege of our upbringing in Christianity. It does give us a warning here, because sometimes we do think that we, kind of got the Christian life down and we know all the protocols and we know all the service times and we, I don't know, we know the things, what we're supposed to do when those special events come at Easter and it, we, we, we know all the way, the workings of the church. And the Bible tells us here, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Let's don't ever get so locked in as just a routine of church and the routine of life to go to church and the routine to sing in the choir and the routine of teaching a class and the routines of all the Christian things that we do. And those are great routines to have in your life. They're the best. Make them a routine just to be in church, responsibilities and show up. But let's also not get to the point we're so used to it that, that we miss the blessing of it the opportunity to have serving the Lord Jesus Christ with the gifts and talents that he's given to us to be able to serve in a church like this and to be able to just I'll be a part of so many things. When you go to a large church and you get um, an opportunity to sing in the choir or you get an opportunity to sing a special or maybe teach a Sunday school class, it's a super big deal because there's so many people, you understand? And there's so many people that, you know, it's not, it's not just automatic that you're gonna get, get these opportunities. A church this size in some sense is just very ideal because there's, there's always things to do, right? We always need people to pitch in and help. There's always, there's always stuff. And we run a, a really large program here for children and uh, big days and all kinds of things that go coming up on Carnival Sunday. And I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's an all hands on deck. So if you're here tonight breathing, yes, we need you to work in Carnival Sunday. If you're partially breathing, we'll put you over with Dan and do the hot diggity dog there with Dan and Deb. You understand though, the, the, these are these are things that other people don't get the opportunity to do sometimes in larger churches and they would really like to get more involved and they just don't have the opportunity. I will tell you this as a parenthesis in the sermon, a lady was at the, uh, the uh, counter, the visitor's center there and, and anyway, she, she started, she, she recognized me and I didn't recognize her, but she recognized me and started talking to me, you know, and uh, she told me, she said, you know what? i would never seen anybody I don't think she used the word acclimate, but that's the word she should have used. Uh, but I, I've never seen anybody acclimate to this church as fast as the Nelsons. She said, it's like they've always been here. And uh, she said, it's just, it's, I, I've never seen anything so fast as uh, new staff members coming in 
and just like instantly, it, you just feel like they've been here. And she said, it might be because Angie was here earlier when she was growing up, but she said, I've just, I've just never seen anybody just, just go right into things like this, except for Matt. He, he too was, where's Matt? Oh, I lost him, he's right there. I'm looking right past you. I knew Al wasn't Matt, but, uh, but they've acclimated, and Matt too has acclimated real fast too. And, uh, but it's just, and I'm really, I was really blessed to hear that because I was a wee bit concerned about that myself having been there for 40 years. And so it's really been a great blessing for them just to have had a lot of opportunities. But they're super talented people though, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm really blessed to hear that. And so, but young ones, just uh, new Christians, when I say young ones, you're such a blessing to us. And I want you to know that we, we're so happy and glad that you're here and that you've come to Christ and to watch you grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is just beyond beyond the blessing that we could explain to you. For us that have had this great beginnings and great opportunities in life, let's, let's, be, let's be very careful to not take those things for granted. We will face the Lord someday. And some of us are gonna be too talented people. And it's not gonna be necessarily your station in life or when you came to Christ, but some people have more more gifts and talents or they have certain things or maybe they things that they learned as a child and it enables them maybe to to do some things but let's 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 make sure we're taking advantage of those things that we can do and uh, i know you are everybody i think is, that i know of is, is is all hands on deck and doing a great job but let's let's take that as a as a privilege even though we need you to do what you're doing but let's still look at it like an opportunity and a privilege be able to teach children Sunday school and to maybe work with the teenagers and, and if we would still focus on those opportunities that a lot of folks don't get the chance to do and, and a lot of the reasons you're able to do those is because you got a really good head start in life and, and you, so you are acclimating into classes and things. New ones, don't, don't worry about uh, someday getting an opportunity to, to teach because uh, we have nurseries full of children, so we'll, we'll need more and more workers forthcoming. And uh, I don't know how many kids we have in the nursery. I think it's 75 or something. I'm joking, but it's, it's, it might, might be 73, though. I mean, there's a lot of kids in there, right? There's a lot of kids in the, in the nurseries. And so but we've got a big crop of kids coming up and, and uh, a lot of kids going to camp. A lot of kids uh, pray, let's pray that they head off to Bible college or serve God wherever God has for their life, but they find God's will. The judgment seat of Christ, it'll be interesting. And for those of us that have been saved when we get there, and I think sometimes we'll look at ourselves and we're gonna realize that a lot of, a lot of folks that didn't get, the, didn't get the jump start that we got, didn't get all the assets in childhood that, that we got. And we're gonna be looking at Don't ever, ever think for a moment, God is a just God, no matter where you came into this thing. Your reward, your, your, your assets will be rewarded as much as anybody's. You give all you have to God while you have the opportunity, and God will take care of the results. He's a just God. And from the time you came to Christ till the time you see the Lord face to face, maybe some years less than somebody else, but I will tell you, I believe with all my heart that God is going to enrich and give you opportunities and will bless you in a special way for serving the Lord with the days that you gave him. Don't think that you're going to be a secondhand or a second-class citizen in heaven because you came to Christ later and it took you a while to acclimate or it took you a while to, to, to get into the groove of Christianity and kind of feel like you were one of the crowd. You're one of the crowd whether you like it or not because I... I love you right where you're at, okay? You should love you right where you're at. Dan told me I should preach a message on that. Just love them right where they're at. And I, uh, that's, it. that's the way I see it. You're loved right where you're at, and we're having a blast watching you go forward for Christ. Those of us that have had the assets, let's, let's work hard for the Lord. Those that are coming in later in life, don't despair. Don't despair like, boy, it's going to take me a while to catch up. Oh, no, no, God will take care of all those things. He is a just God and a fair God, and Boy, God has, has saved you and brought you into church and has a plan for your life. 
and we're all excited to watch that develop as you grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, let's be, let's be really a positive towards all new people that come here. You are, already are. You're reaching out in just an amazing way. But let's continue that process of acclimating people to the church as quickly as we can. And we've got just uh, the discipleship program. Pastor John, how many are involved in discipleship now? 14 people. 14 people being discipled right now. And so that's just uh, an ama amazing thing. So that's a blessing to see that happen, those that are being discipled. And then we've got some good materials and, and just um, uh, the classes that are going on now, the soul winning, uh, kind of a brush up class for soul winners. And if you don't know how to go soul winning, uh, great classes that are going on on Thursday and on Saturday morning. Sometimes I look at Christianity and I think, see fundamentalism or fill in the blank. Maybe you grew up in GRBC or CBA or one of the, one of the, the uh, conservative Baptist type, type situations as I did and until I was 16 and I was uh, at First Baptist. But sometimes we look at ourselves and we, we coronate ourselves as the gold standard of Christianity. And I, you know, I can feel that way with you because I've, 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 been, I've been in it all my life. Um, let's make sure that we don't get the attitude of this man when he was looking down on somebody else. We, 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 we are, a, a, I think, a, a group that, that I, I pray is pleasing to the Lord is in relationship to our stand and, and our, our, our faithfulness. It, it's, it's, it's not really rocket science, but this is the Bible that our forefathers had. This is the Bible that our government, believe it or not, printed to hand out to the citizenry. citizenry. Early in our history, they, they printed King James Bibles and gave out 20,000 King James Bibles to citizens of the United States because they realized that the citizens didn't have Bibles. They had come across on these, these ships and many of them had lost their, all their valuables and they, 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 they printed, they, they paid for it. They printed 20,000 King James Bibles to hand out to the colonies. This is the Bible of the United States of America. And so it's, a, it's a, the King James Bible. It's the Bible that we use in this church and the Bible that we believe that God has ordained for us to use. I'm, um, what other churches do is literally not my affair. It's, a, it's their affair. But uh, most people in fundamentalism are still with this book. I believe it's the, clearly the book that God has given to us and it's one we're gonna stay with. But let's don't, because of these types of things, I love the music of our church and all those things, but let's don't look down on others because of what we've had. Does that make sense to you? Let's, let's, don't, let's, don't, let's don't look down on other Christians and say, well, we, we, they're not using the same Bible we are, or they don't do things they, like we do. It doesn't mean we're gonna become like them that's not the point. The point is, let's don't, let's don't look down on people. We may disagree with them, but let's don't get like this man. He's looking down on somebody else, and I don't think that pleases the Lord. And I certainly have had times in my life that I thought that way, that we were just kind of the, the gold standard of, of Christianity and the things we did and, and the way we do them and the books and the Bible that we use, and I still believe it. But I, I still don't think it's appropriate for us to look look at other other Christians and, and look down on them and say, well, they're 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 not what they ought to be or this or that or the other. Let's um, let's stay faithful to what we believe and what we were raised up as. But let's let, let's don't become like. I'm glad I'm not like that guy. The Lord knows the hearts, and, and we don't know what their path to Christ was. And in a lot of cases, in many cases probably most cases, people that have come to Christ that are going to some different kinds of churches, I'm just glad they got saved. I'm just glad they came to Christ. I'm just glad they heard the gospel. And so they're perhaps going to the church that reached them. So I, I just want to be careful about 
let's don't get pompous about, well, we're the gold standard. Let's, let's, let's do the right things. Let's, let's keep the right book. Let's sing the right songs. Let's have the right attitude. But let's don't, let's don't get pompous about um, superiority over other Christians. I don't, believe, I don't believe that would please the Lord. I think we stay humble, period. I think that's what God longs for in his Christian, is that we be humble. And when you meet another believer, praise God for it. I don't, have to, I don't have to play 20 questions with them to figure out if I agree with them on everything. I, I, I really I don't, have any, I don't have any desire for that whatsoever. I'm just glad he's on his way to heaven or on, her on her way to heaven. They answer the door and they tell us, yeah, I'm born again. I attend this in church. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the night that you've given to us. And Father, just certainly not a sermon of chastisement in any way, I don't believe. But just a, a sermon of challenge that, Father, we would just, uh, the joy that we have for these new believers, may we sustain that joy. May we sustain, if ever, a need for patience, Father. Maybe we need some patience to, to let people grow and, and incur, give me encouragement to them, Father. They're going to have setbacks that are going to be difficult. And I pray, God, that we be, as a church, a constant encouragement to the new, the new believers. Thank you that they're here. And then, Father, for other Christians, I pray, God, that we would just be grateful that they came to the gospel of Jesus Christ and they trusted Christ as their Savior. Their path, Father, may not be the same path as ours, but I pray, God, that you would just please continue to keep our path straight, our path right. Thank you for the, the great heritage that we have here at this church of over well over 40 years. Thank you for it. God bless these people. Bless their children. Thank you for the tremendous opportunities, the facilities we have to conduct all these programs. And Father, the finances that have been so faithful once again this year to meet all the needs of the church. And Father, I just pray that you just continue blessing this place. And may we stay faithful to you, O oh Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll have an invitation song. I don't know if the Lord's moved in your heart at all tonight. 